Welcome back. In 1817, 16 years after he published the piece we just heard, Beethoven received a brand new six octave piano as a gift from the English manufacturer of Broadwood and Sons, shipped from London to his home in Vienna. Thomas Broadwood had met Beethoven in Vienna earlier that year, and he wrote later in a letter to the publisher Vincent Novello that when he visited the famous composer, he was already ailing physically. His table supported as many vials of medicine as it did sheets of music paper, and his clothes so scattered about the room in the matter of an invalid that I was not surprised when I called on him by appointment to take him out to dine with us to find him declared after he had one foot in the carriage that he found himself too unwell to dine out and he retreated upstairs again. I saw him several times after that in his own house, and he was kind enough to play to me, but he was so deaf. Evidently, Broadwood decided that the composer's hearing was in such bad shape that he needed a louder instrument. English pianos at this time were the loudest ever constructed. So when he returned home to London, he asked several porte pianists to help him design a new piano to send to the composer. Beethoven really appreciated the expanded tonal range on the Broadwood piano, and he immediately set to work on the famous Hammer Clavier Sonata, which he wrote in 1818. And then soon afterwards, he began the Opus 109, 110, and 111 sonatas, which were all composed between 1820 and 1822 and were his final attempts at the keyboard sonata genre. Tonight, we'll hear the Opus 110, but all three of these final sonatas were written at the same time. We know this from looking at Beethoven's sketchbooks, which also show that he was working on ideas for the Misa Solemnis and the Ninth Symphony during these years as well. Certainly, the composer's deafness affected his music in the later years of his life, and so did his propensity for radical tonalities and deep expressivity. Scholars have called the sonata a bit of an oddity. It is on one hand somewhat short for a Beethoven piano sonata, clocking in at around 19 minutes. On the other hand, it takes the listener on such an extremely emotional journey from light and playful, even crude, to deeply passionate and sublime, all through that short period of time. The first movement is marked moderato cantabile molto espressivo. And this opening bar also has the additional description of con amabilita, with charm. This is indeed charming music, quite beautiful, with rushing sweeps of notes up and down the keyboard. Although Beethoven sticks to the usual sonata rondo form, he alters many of the typical harmonic progressions so that it sounds fresh and new. The second movement is a mischievous scherzo and trio marked allegro molto, complete with syncopated rhythms. The joke for the listener is that straight away Beethoven launches right into quoting two Austrian popular melodies, probably sung at the boisterous beer gardens of the day. The first is Das Liebe Katchen, a very silly song about a cat having 63 kittens. The other song is Ich bin luderlich, du bist luderlich. I am a dissolute slob and you are a dissolute slob. These two uh, Austrian songs continue to interrupt each other until finally the kittens have the last word and the movement ends with this over the top conclusion, which is almost a parody of the end of a virtuoso piano concert. The large final movement is a look back into the past, if not an outright nod to J.S. Bach, the master of the Baroque fugue. Here Beethoven plays with what he labels an arioso dolente a sorrowful aria in some sublime free form sections, which he places in a sort of tension with two fugues. He literally turns the fugue on its head as the second fugue subject is a literal inversion of the first. Here, we can hear his signature compositional technique of making a large piece expand outward from a tiny theme. Although the markings at the beginning of the movement call for complaining, lamenting sounds for the performer, by the end of the sonata, as the music writer Leslie Gerber has described it, the fugue is now unhampered by interruptions and rushes triumphantly to one of the most joyous conclusions in all music. Initially, the piano sonata Opus 110 was supposed to be dedicated to Frederick Ries, one of Beethoven's favorite students. But as was common with Beethoven, the two had a falling out in the months before the piece went to the publisher. And Beethoven dedicated it to his friend Antonia Brentano. Significantly, Antonia Brentano is the woman whom scholars believe is the most likely candidate to have been Beethoven's immortal beloved. Here's an excerpt from the famous mysterious letter. Perhaps you can decide whether the piece was inspired by his love for her or not. My thoughts go out to you, my immortal beloved, now and then joyfully, then sadly, waiting to hear whether or not fate will hear us. I can live only wholly with you or not at all. 
Oh God, why must one be parted from one whom one so loves? Your love makes me at once the happiest and the unhappiest of men. Love me today, yesterday, what tearful longings for you. You, you, my life, my all, farewell. Ever thine, ever mine, ever ours. Beethoven's final piano sonatas have always been difficult for players and critics alike. During his time and in ours, it's far more likely that we'll hear the middle period works in a concert. For example, we hear five performances of the Pathétique to any one of the later sonatas. The fact is that audiences always found this music difficult to understand and to listen to, and the performers have found them especially technically challenging. We can see in these late sonatas the immense ideas that he's reaching for in the Missio Solemnis and the masterful Ninth Symphony something transcendent, spiritual, sublime. In tonight's performance, we can hear some of the music that Beethoven's contemporary, the German writer and composer E.T.A. Hoffmann, said wakens just that infinite longing that is the essence of Romanticism. <laughs> 